Budget battles heat up and pot is still illegal in Illinois. We'll talk about it next on Capital View. Welcome to Capital View, the program where we talk about state issues, state government, uh, sometimes the federal government, and how it just might affect your life. I'm Bernie Schoenberg from the State Journal Register. Got a couple of uh, state house uh, uh, experts with me today, which is great. Charlie Wheeler is back, uh, director of public affairs reporting program, University of Illinois Springfield, longtime Sun Times correspondent at the state house, many years ago. But uh, it's amazing how well he's still very active. <laughs> Charlie, welcome back. Always good to be here. Yes, he still ask the best questions when they come out with a budget every year. Uh, uh, Benjamin Yount is here. Uh, a storied past, but currently with uh, Illinois State House <laughs> News, which provides uh, 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 coverage for the web, radio, TV, whatever, and print, whatever you want. All over the place. Uh, we are in a process of being just a few weeks away from when the state has to uh, pass a budget. Uh, the Governor Quinn has not yet got the General Assembly to pass a borrowing plan. Uh, the Greater Springfield Chamber of Commerce and uh, a variety of local businesses and institutions got together and promoted a borrowing plan uh, that they said could uh, bond some money now and pay off within four years. Governor Quinn actually said that was a good idea. Um, you've got uh, the General Assembly already working on several different appropriations bills for different agencies, but obviously, as usual, Democrats and Republicans have different numbers. Charlie, are they going to be able to pass something by the end of the month, and any thoughts on that local plan? Well, I suspect they will get something together by the end of the month. For the, the, the Democrats, the urgency is that if the budget making slides over past the end of May into June, then they will need Republican votes to pass a budget. The reluctance on the part of some of the majority Democrats to vote for the various plans that are floating around is they do not want to make the deep cuts that are going to be necessary, particularly in human services, to fit next year's spending within the caps that are going to be in place under the new budget legislation enacted last year. And so you've seen the comments uh, in the appropriations committees as members are suddenly starting to realize what's in front of them. We can't cut this program. We can't cut that program. Uh, you know, this, spare this because this is so important to the future of Illinois. Those are tough choices. But for the, the Democrats who are reluctant to cut in some of these human service areas, I would suggest that should Republicans have a seat at the table, the cuts might even be deeper and might be in areas where the, where the Democrats don't want to see cuts. So at the moment, the Democrats can do it all by themselves and they can kind of prioritize what their interests are. Once we go past the end of May, we need additional votes for the budget to take effect in time to work for the coming fiscal year. And that's going to require Republicans whose set of priorities are different. So I think the, the Sooner or later, it will dawn on some of these holdouts that, yeah, we got to do this. We don't like it, but we have no well, choice. And the Republicans are also, yeah, and, and, and you also have the dynamic between the House and the Senate this year that's a little different. Uh, the House is moving forward with its committee process, and they're really taking a look, particularly at education and human services, at some, some, some firm numbers. We're starting to get a rough shape of what those budgets are going to look like. It's vastly different in the Senate. The Senate has a ballpark idea. Governor Quinn's budget is give or take $36 billion. The House Democratic plan is 33.2. The Senate Republican plan is 30. So they want to take $6 billion or so uh, away from the governor. Five to six Are we billion. talking general revenue? General funds? revenue. Yeah. 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 Take 5 to $6 billion away from the governor. Uh, whereas the House may only want to take, what, 2 to 3? I, I think that, that there is this, as Charlie said, there's there's going to be this moment of reckoning when particularly Senate Democrats realize we're either going to have to take some small cuts that could come out of the House or we're going to have to take some big cuts because we're going to need Republicans. And I think that pushes, that pushes something before the deadline. Uh, if I was going to give you a date, I would say it'll happen at about 10 o'clock at night on the 31st. This is going to be delayed as long as it can 
uh, and, and the conference committee is going to have to come together because there's still, you don't have agreement among Democrats in, in either chamber. You don't have agreement between both parties in either chamber, and you certainly don't have an agreement between either chamber, and the governor at this point, I think, is irrelevant. What about borrowing either, as originally proposed by the governor, to borrow like eight, I think it was a billion dollars to pay off uh, existing bills so that then you can have a fresh start and not be, in a sense, borrowing from the state contractors, and doctors and hospitals and others who have not been paid. Uh, or uh, that, you know, Greater Springfield Chamber of Commerce plan that says borrow uh, less than that but in a, in a quicker period of time so you can pay it off in, in the same amount of time that this income tax increase that just went on last year is, or this year, which is supposed to be a four-year tax only, we'll see how that works, but then pay it off in that period of time. Any chance of either of those borrowing plans going forward? Senate Republican Leader Christine Rodonio said that they're not opposed to borrowing 100% across the board, but they want cuts before they'll even start to talk about borrowing. Uh, $8 billion, not going to happen. Four, four and a half, I think that under certain scenarios, there would be Republicans who would be willing to vote for that type of borrowing, but they would want three to four billion dollars in cuts in exchange for that. Uh, I, I don't think any Republicans, at least the ones that I've talked to in both the House and the Senate, are willing to settle on a $34 billion budget and then borrow. Uh, they really want to get that number as low as possible and then maybe talk about limited borrowing. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's one of the few areas of leverage that the Republicans have now to try and get the budget shaped according to what their priorities are. Because to do this, to go out and, and borrow money to sell bonds, as is being envisioned and requested by Quinn, requires extraordinary majorities, three-fifths votes in both chambers. Democrats have majorities, but they don't have quite that many, so there would have to be Republican support. Um, and I think it's interesting what you mentioned about uh, the Senate Republican leader, Christine Redonio of Lamont, that she is not categorically opposed to the notion. She realizes that this can be part of a solution. And I think some of it may be that pressure our people, that, that legislators are getting back home from the businesses in their community, from the social service agencies in the community, from the people who in essence have already loaned that money to the state. They provided good and, goods and services for which the state is not paying them. And rather than going out and borrowing the money from people who are in the business of lending, the state, in essence, is borrowing it from all of those vendors. And I know I'm repeating myself. I've said this over and over again <laughs> for like, you know, six months. But to me, it's, it's got to be part of the, of the solution. You have to make good on the obligations you already have. You just can't keep stiffing vendors. Yeah. A, well, lot of them, a lot of them, th there have been people, businesses, small businesses, that actually shut their doors because they are owed so much money from the state. They don't have the money to pay their, the cash flow to pay their ongoing expenses, to pay for the commodities that they have to buy to turn around and sell, to pay their workforce. I yeah. mean, it's just when, when, crazy. When, when the comptroller, when, when Judy Bartopinka recently released a report that said the, the backlog uh, could hit $8 billion by the end of the fiscal year, you know, June, July, uh, we, 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 we localized that story. We called a number of people who are owed money by the state, talked to a pharmacist in Alton, and you know he's owed about two hundred thousand dollars. He's got to wait you know, fifty days or so to get a check. That's better, he said, than when he was owed four hundred and fifty thousand dollars and had to wait ninety days. Uh, but it, he said that, that he has he has two pharmacies, one in Alton, one in Cahokia. In Alton, he's 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 better able to manage it. Although the medical building that he's in, he's the only one who still deals with the state. Wow. The doctors stop because they weren't getting paid. You, you hear all sorts of of anecdotal stories about that, and, and, they're, and they're real. That's one of the reasons why I don't think that the Republican opposition to borrowing is as political. Uh, it's, I don't think they're doing it just out of political spite to stick it to the Democrats or because they don't like Pat Quinn. I think that this is one of the issues that voters, you know, they elected a Republican comptroller, they elected a Republican treasurer. I think that, that voters understand, hey, we may want somebody who's not going to spend nearly as much. Right. Of course, when you talk about billions in cuts in spending, then you get into, as Charlie was saying, the specific programs that people don't want cut. You know, we're seeing advertisements, don't cut my child care, which is, you know. Oh, if you look at the DHS budget. But we're also seeing advertisements on the other side from 
group, business group in Chicago that says, oh, those state employees, their, their pension is too high. They don't deserve that. And you've got blowback now from the unions, of course, saying, I worked for this money, and, and advertisements, too, on those commercial stations <laughs> saying well, those see, things. It, it, so it, what it, effect does all of that have? Well, th to me, this whole arguing about the pensions, in a sense, is irrelevant to the fiscal 2012 budget. Mm -hmm. Let's say the legislature decided uh, okay, we're going to abolish public employee pensions whatsoever, altogether. All, all no more public employee they pensions. They still owe all period. the money they owe right now. They is still what you're would owe all the money they, that, they, that they now owe. That legislation, before the ink is dry on Quinn's signature, would be challenged in court. And before that plays itself out in the court process, we'd be in fiscal 2013, 2014. So it has no immediate impact on what we're facing now. What about it's a long-term issue. The Quinn administration also floated this idea that companies that are in the business of borrowing could kind of pay pay off a lot of the state debts to vendors and then be paid by the state in a, in a period of time. Charlie, I think you're familiar. Or that, 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 that's still, and, 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 and Charlie mentioned this, uh, that, that, that used to be a practice here in Illinois. That still just reminds me of those commercials that are on late at night where they say, are you owed a, a, a settlement? Do you, get, do you get payments? Would you like, it's your money, you need it now. It I just, love that it, guy's voice, that J.G. Wentworth yeah, it guy. Always, it always has that <laughs> air of, and, and it may be completely unfair to those companies, but I think, I, I would imagine that a lot of people would have that feeling of a company that buys debt to, with the expectation, I just don't know if that just, I don't know. I, I don't know if, I, if the state should be in that business. So the if state you were elected, you would bills. not yet vote for this. I, well, I, I don't think it, it doesn't require a vote, does it? That's right. No, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that the state they can, can do, do this administratively. It's right. the smell test. And, well, it's, it, in, in a sense, it's a good business investment. You assume the, the uh, what would you say, the, the right to collect money that's owed an individual. You pay that individual the money up front. You then are the person to whom the state will make the payments at 1% a month interest. Now, 12% rate on return is not shabby. No. So it, it seems to me it's, it would solve the problem in the sense it would get the people their money right away. It would be more costly in the long run for the state rather than going out and selling bonds on the open market where the interest rate would not be 12%. It would mm -hmm. be maybe half of that. Um, but it's, again, it's, it's just a way that's being considered because of the desperate straits a lot of these people who do business with the state are in. Yeah, and I, I think Dean Olson of wrote the story about this on at the State Journal Register, which I'll just give well, a little they did, credit they did, that, they did that with Medicaid mm -hmm. debt probably 30, 35 years ago for a while. Wow. There were companies out there, they were called factoring agents. Um, there was some scandal involved in it then. Some of the the companies weren't totally on the up and up, and so the state moved away from that practice. Well, but now they're trying to look at all opportunities to do different well, th things. Th this is the most desperate that we've been in terms of budget situation as long as I've been watching this. Um, shifting gears a bit, um, it looked for a while like medical marijuana might become legal in Illinois, despite some of the, I guess if you don't like legalized drugs horror stories that came out of California where they made it legal and then they've, they've got shops apparently selling it to all kinds of people for all kinds of things. But a very restrictive bill came before the Illinois House. Uh, Lou Lang of Skokie, Democratic representative, has been the sponsor. The surprise in recent days, <coughs> days was that Tom Cross, the House Republican leader, said that under as the bill was written, he could support it too and thought he'd bring some votes with him, but then it didn't end up passing. If, if Tom Cross brought some votes with him, there were others who left. I, I want to say that it fell just one vote short uh, back during the, the lame duck session or, or, or maybe it certainly I think was, it was like four votes. votes. It, was, it was very close. It only got 53, so it was seven well, votes this, away. Yeah, this time. Uh, it, so it, it, it did worse. I, I, I didn't put two and two together until I was walking out of the building today. Also, it was Police Officer Memorial Day. I don't know <laughs> if, if, if uh, you know, a, a bill that was as objected to by certain members of law enforcement uh, should have been called on a day when there were lots of in uniform police officers in the house. But I just, I, 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 at this point, I'm starting to feel bad for Lou Lang. He, <laughs> he, 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 has, he has very good intentions, and he makes the same speech every year. Lawmakers tell me off, you know, when, when we're not voting that, Lou, I hope you pass this bill, and Lou, I support you, but I can't vote for you. And it just, 
he he really truly believes he really truly wants this. Yeah, uh, but because it eases pain of people in pain, and there's and some doctors say there's no other way to get that done. It's like watching your kids strike out at a little league game. You just feel so <laughs> bad for. Them. I'm sure Lou will appreciate well, that. You, were I a betting person, I would have lost a lot of money on this one, because the fact that the bill narrowly missed last session, and there were some objections about some of its terms. Uh, it could be cons the old bill could have been construed too widely that anybody mm -hmm. with any kind of a, an ailment could have gone to a sympathetic doctor and got a prescription. You could grow the stuff at home. Uh, this new bill was very tightly regulated. It spelled out a laundry list of specific conditions, medical conditions that a doctor would have to diagnose you and give you a written like affidavit saying, yes, I'm suffering from um, multiple sclerosis and medical marijuana is the only thing that will alleviate my condition. Then you would have had to go to one of 59 dispensaries. Which would be all, you would have one all percent of the state, of district, 1% you, of district. you couldn't grow it at home. You'd have to go to these tightly regulated places to buy it. And as a matter of fact, uh, I think a couple of the law enforcement groups went to neutral because the bill was much more tightly drawn. Then, as you mentioned, the Republican leader in the House said, yes, uh, this new bill with its tighter restrictions is something that I can support because of the, the, the compassionate nature of providing relief to people who really need it. So I was amazed that it didn't pass, to be honest. Is it, doesn't this do, just uh, speak to the problem with politics in general, good or bad, and I'm not advocating the bill or not, but there are people who fear those mailers once election time comes around and he voted to legalize drugs. And, oh, and this uh, is this is. Uh, the uh, although I, I also have to say, I, and that's one thing. But interestingly, you know, while Illinois continues to be a Democratic stronghold on certain political things, we also have a very strong kind of conservative base that gets very vocal about such things. Because you know, I saw the emails from uh, the more religious-based groups saying this is a terrible thing. We don't want to go in this direction. So that they have an influence too. Plus, some Tea Party folks won election. This is this is the time of year where I think a lot of lawmakers get mailer itis. That they're very <laughs> scared, and and there are some games played. Both both sides do it. Didn't we just go through an election? It's, well, it, but you, the next yeah, one is always yeah, coming two up. Two years in the house, yeah. uh, and so I, I think that yes, this is this is one of these things that you it's, you know, the, the the medical marijuana people certainly have a better better lobbying group than sex offenders, who every year it gets tighter and tighter. They can't uh, live the, anywhere. The restrictions. Yes. I mean, yeah. essentially, they're going to have to move to you know Mars. Uh, but it's it, you, you. You cannot be pro drug. You cannot be soft on crime. It's th because those are those are very easy thirty second commercials or or a postcard in my mailbox. And if that's all I see, yeah. that's all I see. We'll see where it goes. Um, the, there was a business meeting uh, in Springfield business groups, the Illinois Manufacturers Association and the Illinois Retail Merchants, two of the big ones uh, in the state, hosted a their lobby day uh, this past week, and uh, Governor Quinn went to speak to them. Uh, his topic was workers' compensation. Uh, and he basically said, I'm, you know, I'm with you. I want this bill, some, some reform to pass this year because it's been so long since there's been real reform in that system because it's too costly to business. He says it costs three, or, uh, $3 billion a year in cost to business. And he said he wants to work out a plan uh, that will make sure that you're injured on the job, he says, uh, although the wording of that is a little different from the way some of the advocates want it. He says he wants to save like $500 million a year for business to show, to show that he's pro-business. Business groups and legislators involved in this aren't necessarily on his side. Are we going to see resolution of this issue, which some see as kind of a payback to business to show Illinois cares after the tax increase that just passed in the veto session? Uh, are we going to see a compromise on workers' compensation this spring? I think there'll be legislation that passes, and I think whatever it says, uh, the business people won't be totally happy. Um, and the unions, the organized labor and the trial lawyers won't be happy with it either, so maybe it'll be a good compromise. The, the difficulty is that, that the governor is focusing on a couple of areas. Uh, one is uh, improving the administration of the program in terms of the arbitrators who uh, consider the cases, administrative judges in essence, who consider the cases in the first place, and then the industrial, or it's called the Workers' Compensation Commission. It used Commission to be the Illinois now. Industrial Commission, yeah. right. That then um, hears appeals. 
he wants to tighten the qualifications for people to be on those panels. One of the complaints from the business community is that the current crew of uh, administrative law judges tends to side with injured workers yeah, they just more than they make ought awards to. and they're they're yeah. costly to business. And the second thing that he wants to do, the major thing, is to reduce the fees that doctors can charge for treating injured workers. And of course, the medical society isn't going to like that. The area that, as you said, I think he's kind of squishy on is the area of how do you define what actually constitutes an on-the-job injury. And the business community wants a very strict standard that it has to be uh, clearly on the job. It can't be your weekend softball injury that you right. come to work and, and it, then claim and workers' comp. You, you, it, it has to be at least 50% responsible for that incident on the job. And that's not part of the governor's plan, as I understand it. And so that's going to be Yeah, although he did, when it was turned in the business group, say that I, I want it to be on the job, but then uh, there's, yeah, a, there's he, a word for that that he, he would... He, he causation. Causation. Is the, and is he the, didn't, he didn't agree that it is he, causation. He, didn't say cause, he, he said, you know, we want to make sure that, that, that if, if you really are injured on the job that you get taken care of. Uh, he's, he's a little... He's not firm on the details. And that's the problem. Well, say, with you say this. it's not in a bill yet because they're still negotiating and they're moving forward. There's, is what he there's says. no bill. There's no sponsor. He's not. He's he, he's not ready to back John Bradley's bill to blow it up. Kyle McCarter, who was the this other, this would be a who, Southern Illinois Democratic Metro representative East, who says, uh, "Let courts decide and not have a workers' comp yeah. system." Metro East Republican anymore. Kyle McCarter was, mm -hmm. was said, you know, his his bill was the Republican version in the he's Senate, from Lebanon, Illinois. Lebanon, yes. right close to the metro. <laughs> uh, it, it, it came and went and failed in the, in the Senate. Well, his, so his was a business committee dream yeah. legislation. Yeah, and, it, and so you, you've seen the two sides. The governor is somewhere in the middle, but you don't know exactly where he is. I think, I think that it's, it, it continues to highlight a problem that Pat Quinn has, is that he doesn't seem to get involved until an issue has either been dropped on his desk or he has to. That if he would have if he would have gotten involved from the beginning and said, "Hey, listen, this is where we're going to go. This is what I will sign. This is what I will back. This is what I want. Let's have everybody come to me." Well, he's had he's had this PowerPoint that he's presented it, to business it, groups I've before. I've seen that PowerPoint, and it, ha it has some basics, and it's just that there's a difference between him and the business community on how much causation there will be or there has. Been. This is this is this is a common complaint I'm hearing from not only lawmakers but but people who lobby or people who advocate for groups is that sometimes you just simply don't know what the governor is going to do to your legislation until it lands on his desk. And I think that if he would have been much, much, much more clear early in the session, January, February, you know, March, April, that he's waited till this long and there still is not a specific plan. And and I, I, I don't share Charlie's optimism that there's going to be something before May. I would think maybe veto session in November. I think that they're just going to have too much. And, and what, what, the, what may come may, may just be a stopgap. Uh, but I, I think there's too much work to do on workers' comp, and there's too much work to do on other issues. You right, well, take the governor's time. Well, the governor was specific on one thing in the last several days, and that was when he had a news conference in Chicago to announce that he uh, would veto a bill to uh, approve concealed carry of handguns in Illinois. We are one of only two states now that doesn't allow some form of this. Uh, along with Wisconsin, uh, and uh, it's funny because I guess because the bill would and as we tape this show, it, it's being taken up, so there may be some resolution of where this is at. But it was uh, I don't know was it was it in form? Was it startling? Was it the right thing to do for Governor Quinn to say where he's at, which uh, really was in opposition to a lot of his downstate Democrats who are pro-gun, pro-Second Amendment types. Yeah, I'm not really sure what the. Uh what would you say, what the upside of it is for Governor Quinn? Because I think he puts himself in a position where, um, well, l let me backtrack. For the legislation to pass in the first place, it's going to require an extraordinary majority because the legislation would, it preempts in essence, it would take no away the ability of local governments right. to enact something different. And under the Constitution, that requires a three-fifths majority. Just coincidentally, to override a veto requires three-fifths. So if I'm a legislator, I voted for concealed carry, and me and in the House, 70 of my friends did, the governor vetoes it, it comes back. There's 71 of us already voted for it in the first place. Uh, if, if I thought, and, and I really 
I, I didn't. I don't want to sound like I'm down on, on on the governor this much. But if I thought that we would he was never more think that Ben politically astute, I would have thought that was the plan that he could come out in Chicago to to the group that is probably the, the most open to, to opposition. To, it, to it's it's been a gun control city. It's you know it, those are the people that, that that put him in office, and he could say I don't like this. I don't think it's the right thing. I'm going to veto it. But then pick up the phone and call some folks in downstate Illinois and say, hey, listen, you guys get 71, I'll veto it, it'll come right back to you. And then everybody who's down south gets to go. Well, you don't even have to make that call because well, that, well, that makes you. you <laughs> but you know, what the, you know what the downside on that is, though? Then the governor vetoed it. He gets overridden by Democrats, mostly Democrats. And it's like, man, what kind of a leader are you? Your own party stuck yeah. it to you. Well, it's, and John, John Bradley, we discussed, who's a downstate Democrat from Marion did say, I w wish we would have been told. Although if you call all of, if you have your administration call all the people on one side of a, of a bill, you know, that word's gonna get out before you have your press conference and the, there is yeah, no the, surprise the, the factor. Important, the important answer that the governor gave that I think, and, and as, like you said, as we speak, it's, it's being voted on. The governor did say that he has actively lobbied against it, that he may have mm -hmm. called Democrats mm -hmm. who were on the fence and said, please don't do right. that. He that is, this is a governor who won four counties. Three of them, granted they're not very mm -hmm. large population, but three of them are in southern Illinois. Uh, right. He did not bring a lot of votes to the table for some downstate Democrats. Mm -hmm. These are people who voted for the tax increase and for civil unions. I think that is going to be a this. big problem. Well, we are just about out of time. I'll just note. Uh, that somebody who's very important but not in Springfield a lot, the mayor of Chicago, has had his last city council meeting in Chicago, Richard M. Daly. He and his father have combined to have like 40 years in the, the mayorship of Chicago. Ram Emanuel will, will be sworn in and will become uh, the other leader of many people in Springfield, even if he's not often in Springfield. We'll see how that plays out and if he comes down more often as we go on. In the meantime, we're just about out of time, so I'll just have to say thanks to Charlie Wheeler and Benjamin Yount for helping uh, illumine us on some of these <laughs> issues. I'm Bernie Schoenberg. Uh, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time on Capital View.